Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's uh, seminar for the Water Security Alliance. Uh, for those of you who are new, this is a, a weekly appointment where we get together with um, we get together with uh, academics and professionals to talk about um, anything freshwater related and the most up to date research um, in the field. Uh, and this term has been passed to the cohort of my, so my year cohort for the GW4 Fresh uh, PhD students to, to host um, some of the guest speakers. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes introducing myself and what I do with Fresh um, before passing on, on to today's speakers, uh, Dr. Amy Deacon. So my name is Costanza Zenghi, and um, although my background is mostly in uh, marine biology, uh, meaning that I spent uh, most of my time up until now on or around boats, um, I'm now uh, doing a PhD at Bristol through Fresh uh, in the freshwater ecology of freshwater fish. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the DTP has been very helpful in this because uh, it's really helped me to get up to date with all things freshwater related. And particularly with my PhD, uh, I'm interested in looking at the predator prey interactions uh, of fish under near future environmental conditions. Particularly, I'm interested in looking at how the combined effect of increasing water temperature and turbidity can affect these interactions with the general idea that um, this environmental change, which is being exacerbated by the, um, uh, lots of human activities, not only has the potential to impact um, the, the physiology of the fish and, for example, their hunger levels and their kinematics and activity levels, but potentially can uh, alter the um, perception of their surroundings with consequences in things like um, uh, anti-predator behavior and also foraging and hunting success. Um, so I'm just going to give you a couple of very brief examples just to give you an idea of what kind of things I get up to. So mostly I'm in the lab. No idea. Uh, mostly I mean that, that, that uh, yellow something that oh yeah. put it Sorry. on. Uh, okay. So mostly I'm in uh, in the lab, and this is an example of a quick setup where I put a small fish, the Trinidadian guppy, into uh, a see-through enclosed cylinder where they can interact with their predator. In this case, is a blue acara. And then I can track their movement and see how, by manipulating my environmental parameters, such as temperature and turbidity, these interactions can change. Um, I also do this in the wild uh, by, for example, in this case, uh, always presenting uh, in a safe and closed see-through container my prey stimulus to free roaming wild predators. Um, and as you can see from this photo, this is a great way of studying these behaviors because I'm looking at free wild predators and how persistent they are in trying to get my prey, which I should say at this point that where they're safely contained and uh, what I'm looking at are the visual interactions. Um, and uh, this lovely uh, sites pictures from my field work lit uh, me nicely to the introduction of today's speaker as in Trinidad through Fresh is where I've met uh, Dr. Amy Deacon uh, as she is uh, an assistant professor at the University of West Indies, um, where she leads research in freshwater biology and uh, behavioral ecology. Um, it was quite nice to see that uh, also Amy has got background in marine biology, and she did also a master in marine biology at Bangor University. Uh, and then she first met the guppy during a PhD at St. Andrews University, where she was investigating the behavioral ecology um, uh, as an invasive species. So uh, Emmy's work is uh, really impressive because she has been using uh, these amazing streams in Trinidad as a model ecosystem to address fundamental questions on basically what drives anything from the variation in species composition, uh, predation risk, and also reproductive behavior. 
So with this, I'll pass it on to Amy. Thank you all very much for listening. And there will be time for questions at the end. Thank you very much. I, yeah, great. Okay, is that working for everybody? If you can see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, firstly, um, yeah, thanks very much for the introduction, Costanza, and the invite. Um, thanks to Costanza and Garmin for, um, you know, facilitating me to talk to you today. It's really fun to be able to do this from the other side of the Atlantic. Um, and also, Costanza has really nicely introduced what I'm going to talk about today because she's shown you one example of how you can use the guppy and the ecosystem in which the guppy lives to answer some important questions and I'm just going to give you many more examples of that today. So I hope by the end of this talk I can convince you that you know the guppy and its ecosystem is you know the best model system in the world for answering almost everything. So I'll start just by <laughs> talking of, um, just Flashing this slide up to say thank you to everybody who was involved in the research that I'm actually going to present in today's um, talk, um, which ranges from colleagues in Scotland, Trinidad and in Florida. Especially thank you to my um, PhD supervisor, Professor Anne McGurran, who's been involved in almost everything I'm going to present today and has been an incredible mentor, even post PhD, which, you know, is um, I found is a really important thing when you're starting as an early career researcher or, or um, new faculty. So let's um, zoom out a bit to Trinidad and Tobago. For those of you who might, you might know it's in the Caribbean, but maybe not exactly where it is. And here it is at the very bottom of the Caribbean. And you'll see straight away that it's kind of special because it effectively it's part of South America. And in fact, it was only about um, 10, 15,000 years ago that it was completely connected. And that has a lot of implications for um, the fish species that we find and the freshwater environments that we find in Trinidad. In fact, we still even get colonizers making it just away, just across the sea. Even freshwater species can do that because of the Orinoco, um, reducing the salinity um, of that strait. So it's a really amazing place to study fish biology from that perspective. We have the Caribbean fauna and we also have the South American fauna of fish. But it means lots of things to different people. Um, some people think Trinidad, the land of the hummingbird, we have 16, 17 different species and we have bird watches that come. Our bird diversity is, I don't know, second for density for, for our area in the world or something, something, some statistic like that. And it's really amazing um, for bird watches. We also have the largest population of nesting leatherback turtles um, on our north coast, which is just starting about now. And we have a lovely university campus, which is the picture at the top. We have some of the hottest hot peppers in the world. <laughs> we have uh, nice cold um, local lagers. We have carnival every year, which unfortunately hasn't happened for the last couple of years, but hopefully next year. And then the national bird of Trinidad and Tobago is the scarlet ibis. Um, and you can go and see that in the Carrier Swamp, which is a really amazing kind of trip to do if you ever visit Trinidad. So it's a great place to live and work. Um, but from the perspective of me and the perspective of maybe many of you on this, um, call. It's the home of the guppy and it's what it's most famous for among biologists um, and yeah certainly the reason that I ended up in Trinidad and have been here for more than 10 years now. So today I'm going to talk to you about two strands of my research. Um, one is what can we learn about invasive species by looking at the Trinidadian guppy and that was my PhD started me off on that track. Um, and then I'm also going to end by expanding that to think about the whole ecosystem in which we find the guppy and what we've learned about human impacts um, and patterns of biodiversity by looking um, at that system. And the reason that it's such a great system to work in is because this is a map of the north of Trinidad and you can see, you can ignore the dots, they're just my common field sites, but you can see the rivers here and um, I know some of you will already know this, but those of you who aren't familiar with guppy research, the reason that so many people study guppies is because in the northern range, you have these parallel rivers coming down the southern slopes, which effectively it's a natural laboratory because you have independent populations of guppies, um, independent ecosystems that um, have very similar conditions otherwise, and you find guppies in all of these ecosystems, all of these rivers and these drainages. 
So you can kind of, um, it really strengthens any hypothesis testing or particular question that you've got to answer because you've got this at your fingertips. And then you've got the guppy, which is an amazing species to work with. It's very variable. It has interesting behaviors. Um, it lives well in the laboratory as well as being found basically anywhere in Trinidad. Um, and as a result, um, I did a quick back of the envelope calculation. And I think these days we have about 15 PIs bringing their group to Trinidad each year. Of course, the last two years, no, but this year we're back to nearly up to that number, I'd say, who are bringing their group to do work on the Trinidadian guppy. Um, and if you take a larger um, time scale, that's gonna be even more than that. One of the reasons it's so attractive is because not only do you have this natural replication, you also have these barrier waterfalls in most of those rivers, which mean that guppies can be found above the waterfall, coexisting with um, the killifish, which will eat young guppies, but it's kind of more of a competitor of the guppy than a direct predator. Um, so these are upstream sites where other species of fish, predatory fish, haven't ever managed to breach those barriers because they're quite big waterfalls like the one shown here. Whereas further downstream, you have a whole suite of predators, including the pike cichlid, Perenna cichla, Frenata here. And guppies are also found in those habitats. And research over the last 30, 40 years has concentrated on looking at the differences between these populations at the extreme. So, you know, you find that there are measurable differences in life history, behavioral traits. Um, many other things have been measured just to show that natural selection is acting on these two populations differently. And we have replication of that across these rivers to show and um, learn more about exactly how this is happening. So that is another really attractive aspect of the Northern Range that gives, um, opens up a lot of potential for asking ecological and evolutionary questions. But strangely enough, even though I'm one of the few guppy researchers who's actually based in Trinidad, um, my interest primarily focuses on what happens when the guppy leaves Trinidad and is found all around the world. Um, so this map shows you um, all the different countries that we now actually find Trinidadian guppies established in. So the orange shows the um, countries quite crudely at the country scale, of course, not, not unfortunately, I don't have sort of the data with the coordinates, um, but it really gives you an idea of just how widespread the guppy is. Um, so it's about 70 different countries um, and those cross hatched countries are where guppies are found in sort of geothermal springs. Um, so they don't really spread from there, but you never know that could change with, with climate change in some areas. So it's hugely successful and my research has, a lot of my research is focused on sort of investigating why that might be. And of course, because um, we've had like nearly a century of research on the guppy, we actually know a huge amount of it about its biology as well, which gives us a great starting point for then asking other questions that are slightly more applied. So the guppy in that sense can be a great model species for asking about invasive species because we, we already know about a lot of its traits. And many of these traits really do align with what we expect in an invasive species. So these are just some of those that I've brainstormed here. So, so different traits that you could argue would make the guppy successful if introduced to a new habitat. Um, and yeah, you, you, can, you can see how all of these um, have, could be investigated and have been investigated by different researchers. But the ones I'm gonna to present to you today are those that relate specifically to the reproductive um, abilities of guppies, which are very specialized. And guppies actually give birth to live young, the oviviparous. Um, they also store sperm, which means once they've mated, they can still um, give birth to broods of young for six, more than six months after that mating event and multiple times. Those sperm can be for multiple males, which means when they have a brood of babies, they can have different fathers. So you can have um, increased genetic variability in terms of the broods that they actually are producing. And they have a very short generation time. So for the, from the point at which a little young guppy pops out, about three months later, that young guppy could be having its own young. So within a year, you're talking about, you know, three to four generations um, happening. So this, is, this experiment now is something I did during my PhD, which was looking at why, how, how those reproductive traits might actually translate to um, an ability to establish well. So I looked at single wild guppies. So I took single wild guppies from um, streams in the northern range. Um, as I said, they store sperm. We know they're oviviparous. We also know actually that they 
mate all the time. So if you take a, an adult female from the wild, chances are she has you know, mated and is um, pregnant effectively. So I asked the question, well, given all of that, can they actually establish a population from a single female? And taking advantage of that upstream downstream situation that I just described, does um, that difference in that background and evolutionary history have an impact on um, how well they're likely to establish? And what you might expect, for example, is that um, downstream populations that have co-evolved with predators are likely to have life history traits that mean, well, we know that they do have life history traits, which means they, they breed more quickly, they have more smaller young. They, so these might be, you can imagine these might be successful traits in terms of very rapidly establishing a population. So you might, might expect some differences there. And this is the roof of my department where I now work um, on the, the, um, my outdoor lab. <laughs> um, and these music are still there. I've expanded it, in fact, so I now have even more of these on the roof. Um, but these were just 30 for this initial experiment where I put a single female in each of these tanks. Half of them were from a downstream population, half were from an upstream population. I left them for one year and I didn't really do much. It was a very low maintenance experiment. And I just put some gravel in, um, some water hyacinth, and we didn't feed them, but they're outside, so things were falling in, algae was photosynthesizing, um, and they did incredibly well. So after 12 months of just leaving them there, all we did was top the water up when it got a little bit low. That was literally the only maintenance that we did. 91% um, of our populations had established, and in other words, had reproduced and was still a viable population. So we left them for another year and the same populations, and we still had an extremely high success rate. We found no evidence in any difference because there was such a high success rate. There was, we couldn't detect any difference between the populations. So upstream and downstream were equally good um, and had equally large populations at the end of this experiment. We then took it one step further by bringing in females um, from those musicals and populations after two years. So females that were the several generations from those founder females, um, bringing them into the laboratory and also catching wild females again from those same source populations and bringing them into the laboratory to see how their young, um, how viable the young were in terms of their behaviors. So another great thing about guppies <laughs> is um, that there are lots of nice, because they do so many um, nice measurable behaviors and they're so small, then there are assays that you can do to relatively easily um, sort of gauge differences in things like behavior uh, between those two extreme populations. So we looked at the anti-predator behaviors of fry from these two year established mesocosm females and compared the behavior of those, those young with those from the wild caught fish in the lab. So that all of the young had been born in the same conditions, but their parents had either come from the wild or from my rooftop tanks. And we looked at shoaling tendency, reaction distance, predator inspection frequency, which is another really cool behavior that guppies do, um, in evasion ability, in other words, how good they were at avoiding me trying to catch them with a net in a little tray, um, really nice, um, easy to measure behaviors that are actually very consistent and they seem crude, but it's incredible that, you know, it's, it's really, um, um, when you actually do them, you realize how um, good they are at really finding these differences, even in what seem like fairly crude um, experiments. And this is what we found, we found that there were no differences between, there were no um, differences between the wild and the mesocosm tank. So the, the young from the um, wild and the young from the mesocosm both um, sh showed the same behaviors effectively and showed the same differences in behavior. So in other words, we could see this behavioral signature of the evolutionary history, even in our mesocosm po population. Um, and they are retaining this despite this, in the mesocosms, despite this severe demographic bottleneck. So we have found no difference between wild and mesocosm, but we did still find consistently this difference between downstream and upstream in their behaviors, just as we would expect. So what this shows us is that um, a single pregnant wild female can successfully establish a population, a viable population with young that seem to still be equipped with these behaviors. We also did a follow-up experiment that I'm not going to go into detail about here, where we controlled for the number of males that the females had been exposed to before we put them into these mesocosms. Um, because before we were just taking these females, we had no idea whether they were multiply mated or singly mated, and we didn't do the genetics to test that either. But in the second experiment, yeah, we found equally good success rates. So even those females that had only been mated with one other male still were very, very good at establishing. <laughs> 
like that. So, for this part of the talk, I want to just take us to back to the map. And all of those studies explained so far, we're looking at these wild guppies and using that um, northern range habitat um, as this model ecosystem. But when we look at the, the way in which guppies have reached those introduced sites, um, we find that it's through a combination of two different main routes. Mosquito control in places like India, Africa, Australia, we know that guppies have, have largely got there because people have introduced them to, to control malaria levels by eating the larvae of mosquitoes. But also the guppy, many of you probably know the guppy primarily um, as an ornamental fish as well. And, and it's the same species, but it's been heavily um, selectively bred for its um, domestic traits and these beautiful tails. Um, and it's one of the most popular tropical fish species um, around the world. It's also these, this breeding takes place outside of Trinidad in, in Asia and in, in the US and in Europe. So that's another route in which we believe some populations have established through escaped aquarium fish. So the obvious question then is, well, given that um, ornamental guppies have gone through this selective domestication process um, to be beautiful, to be able to maybe, maybe inadvertently to be able to survive in certain conditions, but also to have these fancy characteristics, um, that could have affected other, inadvertent that could have affected other traits. So are they just as good? Would that impact their ability to establish um, having gone through that? So in other words, do ornamental guppies have the same remarkable establishment ability as wild guppies? And here is my colleague, Jerome, who was a research assistant with me for a year. Um, he's now off at Princeton doing things with parrots. Um, but he, he and I set up some more of these mesocosms and um, looked at um, the ornamental guppies. We also, we also set up the experiment with the wild guppies as well. So we had the high predation wild, the low predation wild, and the ornamental guppies from the local pet store. And we asked the question about, you know, does, has this domestication process affected their invasive potential? Another view of our rooftop lab. Um, it's very hot in the middle of the day, but it's nice in the mornings and the evenings. And this is what we found. So we left these for one year and we found that 65% of the single female ornamentals were still able to successfully establish. So it was 80 or 90% still for the wild, as the previous experiments have suggested. Um, so it suggests that they're less, they're less able, but they're, it's still a pretty impressive um, ability to establish. It might suggest that perhaps ornamentals might require more frequent introductions or higher propagule pressure to achieve the same level of success as, say, a wild guppy, um, but they certainly still have enough of those traits to be, to be pretty successful. So this would be my conclusion from those studies altogether in brief. They're all just amazing at establishing, which of course is the first stage in, in becoming a successful invasive. But all of these experiments have looked at guppies on their own in a tank. And of course, sometimes around the world, these are, guppies are introduced and this is the sort of scenario they end up having, you know, um, they start off in a tank, in a water tank for mosquito control or um, released into a pond. Um, but what happens when they then have to deal with other species in an even more naturalistic um, environment? So um, chances are, if you're introducing or establishing in a new environment, eventually you're going to come across some other competitor or predator. We know that guppies have very wide tolerances to environmental conditions um, and the they tick all the boxes in terms of ideal invaders, but what about other species and their interactions with other species? And this term biotic resistance describes um, the effect of other species in um, impacting the ability of an introduced species to establish. So to answer questions of biotic resistance, I've looked at two different study systems. One is sticking in the northern range with that model ecosystem and looking at guppies and killifish, and both of these species are native in Trinidad, and they both they coexist, but they're a really good model for looking at how guppies interact with other species in a natural environment. But I've also expanded this research to look at guppies and mosquito fish in Florida and how that plays out in, in an actual introduced scenario. And at this point, um, we can 
I don't know, think a bit more about what actually happens in the, in the natural environment in which guppies have evolved for millions of years, which is this ephemeral um, dynamic environment where we have a dry season and a wet season in Trinidad. You have small streams that sort of almost shrink down to nothing in the dry season where there are just pools or there might be in the wet season, there could be flooded pools that kind of um, on the bank that naturally kind of come and go with the months. And this is the sort of environment that guppies have evolved in. Um, and that's probably why we see a lot of those traits that I mentioned that actually make them good invaders, because they are naturally establishing and going extinct and moving um, on, a, on an annual basis in their natural environment. So using this system of guppies and killifish, because killifish, um, this is the, the killifish I'm talking about here, some people would know it as rivulus, it actually has a new scientific name of anablepsoides now, um, but if I slip into rivulus, um, just remember I'm talking about this killifish, um, and it's um, found in almost all the same places as guppies, it's very widespread as are guppies, it's actually found even in places where guppies haven't managed to breach at the very, very top of the northern range. But it's an interesting one to look at because we know it lives with guppies in these streams um, quite seemingly quite happily, but there are interesting dynamics that are happening with those seasonal changes when one or the other species finds itself in these smaller pools in the dry and the wet season over the seasonal cycle. So we use this system to ask, well, what determines establish establishment success in the native habitat of the guppy? We did two sets of experiments, one using these horticultural, basically big flower pots, plant pots, um, this is at Simla, the um, tropical research station in the Northern Range by Asa Wright Nature Centre. My colleague Doug Fraser has been working on Rivulus for decades, and this is my other um, colleague Fadila Halley, who was also a, a research assistant with me for a while. Um, and we use these horticultural, these are under natural forest cover, but we can also have quite a lot of control about what goes on in them because they're self-contained and we can decide what we add in terms of debris and, of course, fish. So we set these up to have um, guppies either with or without um, killifish. Um, and then we expanded this research to an even more naturalistic setup where we actually built um, pools on the side of the river up in the Arima Valley in the Northern Range. And we had 12 of these pools along a stretch of river. And we could then manipulate when, when we put guppies from the, from the stream itself, we could move them into these pools. Um, and we could move rivulus and guppies into these pools. One thing to remember about rivulus actually is that it's, um, it's a really frustrating and fascinating species to work with and that it is basically a, an escape artist and you have to be constantly changing your experimental setup if you want to try and keep rivulus anywhere. Um, that's why you can sometimes see these, these mesh um, rims because it was the only way we could prevent rivulus from escaping. And even then we're pretty convinced that they did get in and out <laughs> through a couple of our couple of our experiments using as a couple of replicates. So, um, but they're really, they're really amazing and fascinating. But in the end with these bank sized mesocosms, we actually took advantage of the fact that rivulus can actually move across land. So if you have, if you, if you at certain times of the year, they will naturally invade these pools, even if there's not a connection with the water, because they'll jump out of the water, they can breathe through their tail through, um, in air and find their way to, to other habitats. Another adaptation of this ephemeral environment. Anyway, so it was lots of fun to do these experiments um, and we finally got it working so that we were happy with the, the setup. And um, in these bankside mesocosms, we went another step further to think about um, other factors like property or pressure of guppies. How many do you add? And also who arrives first? Is it important if the guppy has had a little head start in these pools um, or does that not matter? The first finding we had was that, um, well, we'd expect. I mean, guppies did extremely well when they're on their own in these both of these types of mesocosms, when without killifish. So confirming what we'd um, already shown from the other studies. But we also found that a single female guppy fails to establish if the mesocosm she's introduced to already contains rivulus. She, she can't manage to establish a population in that case. Um, rivulus and guppy are also an interesting pair of species to look at because they actually eat each other's babies. So guppies can eat very, very young killifish and um, killifish will eat juvenile and young guppies, so a sort of wider range um, of size length, of length that the killifish can eat of the guppy. So they're mainly, the adults will be more competitors, but in the juvenile stages, there's predation going on as well in both directions. 
So they're, they're known as intraguild predator would be the word we would use, I guess, for them. So although they failed when introduced when killifish were already there, we, were we found that order of arrival matters. And if the guppies have three to four weeks to kind of establish and maybe have one brood of young, um, they were able to establish if you then add killifish afterwards um, and persist for a, for a few months. In other words, if guppy is first, then they can coexist. However, if the killifish is there first, then you never go to, that's, that's when we see this evidence of biotic resistance. No guppies. The next factor we, we interrogated was propagule pressure. And here we found, well, as, to reiterate again, single females could not establish in the presence of killifish. But if we increase the founder number from one to either eight or 16, then a good proportion of our replicates did manage to um, establish population. So propagule pressure was really important. We didn't find it was a linear relationship. Eight and 16 were equally likely to establish or fail, um, but they had a chance once the propagule pressure was increased um, to at least eight. And now I'm just gonna talk through a sort of hypothetical scenario of what we think might be happening in these habitats, um, according to the data we've now managed to collect from those combined experiments. So if you imagine a stream of Ridulus and Guppy, they have these seasonal pools where sometimes guppies arrive first, sometimes killifish will arrive first. And then over time, you might get wet season invasions of one or the other species. So you end up with um, combinations. In the case where guppies have arrived first, then you're likely to get both species persisting and coexisting in those, in those environments. But in cases where killifish establish first, then the ability for guppies to persist with the killifish is going to be conditional on various different factors, including propagule pressure. So yes, guppies can be very successful, even in the presence of a competitor or predator, but um, biotic resistance is certainly playing a role and the conditions such as propagule pressure are going to determine whether or not they actually are able to establish under those conditions. So Doug, um, Doug Fraser was presenting some of these results at um, an American Fisheries um, Society meeting in the US and he got talking to two researchers from the University of Florida, Quentin Tuckett and Jeff Hill, and they were very interested in our, in our research on guppies and rivulus. And they said, look, we've got this mystery, the, the mystery of the guppies in Florida. Um, they're invasive species, um, invasive aquatic species specialists. Um, and they said, you know, we, we know that um, Florida has plenty of guppies. We have tropical fish farms. It's a big industry. Um, we also have evidence that they are routinely finding their way into waterways because there are pipes coming out of these ponds that just go into the ditches and, and the rivers. Yet we have no recorded established populations of guppies in Florida. Um, we, know, we don't think it's abiotic factors because we've done some experiments looking at the ability of guppies to withstand um, the temperatures that we have in South Florida. Um, so we suspect that biotic resistance is part of the story in Florida with guppies. So Doug and I then traveled to Florida and did a few research trips and set up some mesocosms with Quentin and Jeff, a um, very similar kind of design to what we were doing in Trinidad with the killifish. But this time we were putting different densities of um, mosquito fish and guppies into these mesocosm experiments and leaving them for um, about uh, two to three months. And this is what we found. So when um, the mosquito fish, Gambusia, which I should say, um, you might know that as an invasive species, but in, in Florida, they're, they're a native species, Gambusia, it's, an, it's part of the native fish fauna. Um, so when we didn't have any mosquito fish in our mesocosms, then guppies did extremely well, just like we've seen you know, in our Trinidad experiments. But even at low densities of mosquito fish, um, which we determined identities by what um, Quentin and Jeff know from their surveys of uh, mosquito fish densities in natural habitats, um, even just a few mosquito fish at a low density still had a huge impact on guppy survival. And you can see from this graph below, we had just barely any surviving and certainly very limited recruitment. So some of the adults survived, but um, they, weren't, they weren't able to reproduce and have babies um, under, that, under those conditions. And you can also see in, this, in, our, in our figure, we've tried to incorporate this caudal fin damage that we noticed on these fish. Um, which maybe is evidence of, it, of how this 
um, biotic resistance is playing out in terms of the mechanism because they were very damaged, those that did survive. When mosquito fish density was high, then basically nobody survived. Even the founder adults didn't survive um, during our experiment. Um, we also, I should just say, yeah, we did a few behavioral experiments as well to try and get further to, to the mechanism of this, um, looking at how gambusia behave towards guppies in aquaria tanks. And they are indeed extremely aggressive, uh, much more aggressive than any, any other psyllid we use as a control. Um, and in terms of chasing and nipping, that kind of behavior was um, uh, really um, prevalent. They also, we looked at, we know that guppies can eat young mosquito fish and vice versa. That same thing with the, with the killifish, there's that intra-guild um, predation where they can both eat each other's young. Um, but mosquito fish being a little larger and more aggressive have a much larger window of um, sort of um, standard length that they can consume for the guppies than the other way around. So they have the upper hand in terms of that part of their relationship. So the conclusions so far are that guppies are exceptional invaders, and keep saying that, and um, they can establish from a single female. Even ornamentals retain this ability. We see that biotic resistance um, from a killifish is an important aspect of their natural dynamics in the northern range, um, but also this translates to what's happening in some places where they're introduced. It can be a mechanism in preventing their establishment. There are still big gaps in our knowledge when it comes to the guppy as an invasive, um, for example, we don't really know how effective the guppy even is at controlling mosquito larvae, even though that's um, one of the reasons it gets introduced and still gets introduced for that reason today. Um, I've, I've made some, um, I guess, uh, a small amount of progress into trying to answer that question, but there's so much more that needs to be done in terms of in investigating this, um, because even my fairly modest experiment looking at what affects their ability to um, choose to consume the vector mosquitoes. Um, I went to India where they have an introduced population and we looked at, are they actually controlling um, the malarial mosquitoes in, in India? And the answer was that it very much determined on the social environment for the guppy. In other words, are there males and females in the tank with them um, and the presence of cover for the mosquito larvae and for the fish. So even manipulating fairly fundamental things in, the, in their environment, made quite a big difference to their consumption rate and their preference, their prey preference as well. So it just raised questions for me as to in these natural environments where there's other alternative prey to mosquito larvae and there's other species as well as other individuals from that population, um, it's, it's gonna be a complex story. It's not as simple as because they like eating mosquito larvae, they're going to eat them in the right sort of numbers. There's also big gaps in, in what the ecological impacts of introduced guppies actually are. It's very difficult to test. Most of the evidence so far is fairly anecdotal. Um, lots of stories of, oh, we, we think it's the guppies that have led to the decline of X, Y, and Z, um, and ecosystem level effects as well, because guppies are in big, large numbers, they breed quickly. So you can imagine they do have an impact um, on the sort of ecosystem um, traits as well as in, on individual species, but we don't have that much evidence of that or able to quantify that. So in terms of making a cost benefit decision about things like mosquito control um, or even the control of introduced um, pet fish um, or the, the, the trade, the pet trade, we don't really have very much data to go on when it comes to that, to weighing up that decision. So I wanted to end the talk by just very um, giving a fairly brief um, insight into some of the more ecosystem level studies I've been doing in the Northern Range, moving on from just the guppy and asking what can we learn about human impacts beyond invasive species um, for the guppy, from the guppy's native ecosystem. So moving beyond guppies at last. The three questions that I'm gonna just um, briefly kind of um, talk about today are, um, questions that I've addressed through my postdoc research, um, looking at how assemblages change over time using the Northern Range to ask that. Do different taxa within the ecosystems have similar patterns over time in terms of the dynamics and their impact, um, their, their re response to disturbance? And can we detect any signature of disturbance in these patterns? 
so I sampled these 16 sites for five years, um, four times a year, to get a really nice temporal data set of what's happening at the whole ecosystem, well, the whole community level, looking at three different taxa. So these are myself with colleagues in the field doing this field work, um, and these are the sites that we, we visited. Now, half of these sites were chosen because they are commonly used for recreation in Trinidad. Going down to the river to have a, a, to cook and to listen to music and to bathe is a big cultural um, thing in Trinidad. People love to do that. And so some sites are always visited for that day in, day out, and some even just a few hundred meters upstream are not. So you have a nice comparison there to make. So we surveyed the fish, we surveyed the benthic invertebrates, and we surveyed the diatoms at these 16 sites over five years. In answer to the question, do the fish assemblages change over time? Well, yes, they do. And here's one example from just one site over that time period, um, showing all the different, so each line, each cut of line is a different species of fish and it's biomass on the y-axis. Um, but what you can see from even just this snapshot example is that there's not actually that much change in alpha diversity characteristics. So things like species richness and evenness were staying relatively constant over the time. Um, but as you can see from the, the ups and downs, there's a lot of turnover and, and dissimilarity between time steps. Um, so we're seeing changes, but um, they're not necessarily captured by um, just looking at those, you know, how many species, et cetera. And this is what we see in global data sets. And, um, Anne McGowan has, and, and other colleagues have looked into that using other data sets, not just Trinidad, and this, this is in line with the sort of patterns that we see globally. And it's important because we need to understand when we want to detect change from human impacts, we need to know what is happening naturally. We should expect ecosystems, um, communities and assemblages to be dynamic, and it's just, um, it's just a case of how much change is, is natural change and how much change is um, that allows us to then understand when the change is, is different and, and could be something of concern. Interestingly, we sort of expected we might see some parallels or some patterns coming out of looking at diatoms, invertebrates and fish, but we didn't really. Um, the patterns are quite divergent between the three. Um, we didn't find any evidence of systematic change at that community level. And they're looking at disturbance because half of our sites were impacted by recreation or potentially impacted by recreation. We did find some, some um, signature of that in terms of fish biomass and species richness was slightly but significantly greater at those recreational sites, um, which isn't necessarily of great concern, um, but it's very interesting to know that you could detect that and we did find that difference. Um, there's definitely some improvements on the local level in terms of how people use these rivers um, in the northern range. Um, responsibly and um, yeah, progress to be made there. So in terms of the future, I mean, I think there's still, we've just touched the surface of what the Northern Range and guppies can tell us about humans um, impacting the environment and biodiversity. And um, I'm really excited about what might be next in terms of how we can um, use this system to learn more. Um, my PhD student with, with Anne McGurran, um, Ada, um, she is coming out this year to revisit those sites that I, those 16 sites again, um, you know, five, seven years later, um, and to add to that temporal time series. And so she's been doing lots of really cool analyses to, to use the most out of that important data set. Um, so that's really exciting. You've already heard about the cool stuff Costanza is doing. Um, the Northern Range is impacted by quarrying. It's one of the biggest problems we have in the Northern Range and that affects turbidity of the water. And we still don't really know the extent of the effects that might be having on the species as well as the ecosystem. So it will be um, you know, really fascinating to, to learn more about that as Costanza's work um, comes together. And then I'm taking on a new student, Stephanie, who's from Trinidad, which is great. And um, you know, she's really interested in what's happening at the cognitive level about um, how environmental change might be affecting decision making and um, um, social behavior in guppies. So that should be a really cool um, study coming in the future. So there's lots of exciting things happening. And just to end, I mean, I hope I've convinced you that Trinidad's Northern Range and guppies are um, just incredible to work with. Um, and they've certainly provided really valuable insights over the years in terms of evolution, ecology, et cetera. Um, and what I noticed though, when I became um, faculty and teaching undergraduates in Trinidad about um, 
well, I teach animal behavior, I teach evolution, and I teach um, freshwater ecology. My students hadn't even heard of the guppy. Many of them had never heard of the species. Um, some of them haven't been to a river. It's not um, without exception, but that was the general impression I got was sort of they were amazed and excited and surprised to learn all these things about what's happened over the last um, hundred years with the species that is native to their country. So it's now my mission to basically use the guppy as an example for almost every concept I have to teach. Um, so I think I may have backfired and gone the other way with boring them about it now. But um, what I'm really hoping is that we can nurture some homegrown talent in Trinidad so that as we expand the research to answer these really important questions, especially about human impacts, these are some of my students looking at urban guppies. This is actually two minutes around the corner from where I'm talking to you now in the drain outside my house, my students um, surveying guppies in the drain. And these are some students on a field course um, looking at freshwater ecology, learning how to sample fish. So I'm really um, hoping that in the future, more of the students from Trinidad will take an interest and have opportunities to have experience and train with those international researchers that might lead to who knows what, but it'll be great to see what happens. So with that, thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have.